um, all very rich and diverse in their in in their own right. So we're going to go now to uh, some facilitated discussion. Back to our facilitator extraordinaire, Jeffrey, um, to lead this session with the panel. Just an ordinary everyday facilitator following an extraordinary chair, Leanne. <laughs> so if I just could frame that appropriately. So thank you everyone panel and Leanne, you're um, part of that because uh, you're the fifth talk um, because you, you spoke at the head of the session from the consumer perspective on integrated care. So that was terrific, each of you. Um, really, um, it gave lots of depth and perspective on integrated care. But can I, can I feed back to you something? We've heard about consumers wanting joint up care. We've heard about hospital in the home and telehealth as being potentially joining up mechanisms, although we also heard some criticism of both hospital in the home and telehealth, uh, especially around the, the evidence base for hospital in the home. And then we heard a couple of great examples, including kids GPS, which I think is very evocative of what you can do to drive integrated care. And then we heard economics at a local level and maybe how we might do smaller scale studies and scale it up. But I want to put back to you something. It's sort of raising it above the talks that you gave. You know, every organization, every human system ever invented has silos, bounded groups, um, problems with connections, different kinds of settings where they don't necessarily talk to each other. They might be us versus you, them, us and them. So how do we really join up the system so that Leanne's patients don't fall through the cracks? How can we use hospital, home, telehealth, uh, economic analysis and kids' GPS type things to roll that out so we really have a more integrated system? So we've heard your perspectives. I'm seeking guidance for the audience on, you know, what are we going to do with this fantastic knowledge base that you're creating for us and these insights that you're presenting to us? to really create an integrated or more joined up or more connected system. Is that enough of a challenge panel? Who would like to start? Uh, it's Rochelle. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go on, go on Rochelle. No, uh, it's just, on, okay. it's, it's more a comment really, but hearing Liam talk, I mean, that just sounds like what, what I would love in practice and, and what happens, but not nearly enough is if, if I have a problem, I ring up a colleague. Uh, if GPs have a problem, they ring me. I tell them what could, they could do. Uh, and then they might tell me what happened and then I may or may not see the patient. And that's sort of called good clinical care and good communication between different health professionals. And, and so I think the key thing is that, that we just have to keep working out a way of of making that so much easier because I know doctors are afraid to ring me for some reason um, but I always ring them back or I always speak to them like I'm there all the time 24 7 my patients increasingly email me or text me with little questions particularly in the last year you know over COVID they just want to check something so it's just, some, and, and in the past I've, that that's not something I get paid for but it's I feel it's part of my job as a health professional so um, it, it's sort of like what we already do but but now through telehealth we we're getting paid for things that that a lot of us have been doing anyway and the key really is trying to communicate I write a letter to, for every patient but the, the GP writes me an initial referral letter but I never hear from them otherwise and so I end up always ringing them so I, I guess that's just a, a, a bit of my clinical perspective on this problem. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're probably an unusual doctor in that way. Um, but, but yeah, I think these systems are, as you say, formalising or systematising what has gone on for a long time. Um, and what I think also what we're seeing with the introduction of some of the MBS item numbers, particularly for telephone consultations, is doctors are now getting paid for something that they have done previously unpaid. Um, 
and that we're, you know, rightly or wrongly, I think it'll come under examination because of sustainability of the health system and, and cost. But but I 100% agree that, that you were simply systematizing things uh, um, that have already happened. It will provide advantage to some people that don't have those relationships to ring up, ring up people, don't know a specialist um, uh, and that. So, yeah. And but I think happens, it's, sorry, I was just going to say, what happens if that that system that you've got, where that they just communicate but they don't see the patient, if something goes wrong, who's who's liable? And yeah, and I, look, I, I I don't know, but but uh, you know, as I said, the system does put in some safety there that it looks at, you know, it, it does provide the mechanism for them to see the patient in person, which is still considered the gold standard of care. So you know, they are trained that that if they are not confident giving a diagnosis, that they need to go back to the default position and organise to see the patient in person. It, it's interesting what you're talking about what you're both talking about is systematizing that communication and um, a lot of it is part of the culture in medicine that you know you personal relationships so you probably have some colleagues that really trust you Rochelle um, and they call you but um, certainly in the um, strengthening care for children we um, there's a telephone line for GPs to ring a pediatrician and a pediatrician is ready to answer that line they're very reticent to call. It's just not in their nature to do that. Um, and that's slowly changing. It's just a different way of doing things. And, and patients increasingly expect to be available. I, I mean, I, they can easily find my email address just going by Googling my, my university address. So you know, I think it is part of a change in culture. And the, um, you know, the, the sharing medical records, um, you know, between hospitals and GPs, I mean, that just doesn't really happen. So, so the solution for, in kids' GPS was to actually give that shared care plan to the family so they could share it with whoever they were seeing at the time, um, you know, and, and they had the power to actually do that rather than having to explain and, and repeat their story over and over again, which is what they were doing before. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so they had the power to actually push that to the GP and GP could actually save it onto their system. I think that was a really powerful takeout message from your presentation, Yvonne, you know, the fact that, you know, the family had the care plan, um, the blueprint, you know, the roadmap on their phone, um, it really did equip, equip them from what you were describing uh, to do exactly that, to, to, to bring the focus back on to the care plan and for them to be the ones initiating conversations and to be the agent, <laughs> uh, to be connecting up. Uh. And I mean, some of, some of the um, results that came out of our national survey, our consumer sentiment survey, Leanne, showed that um, people with chronic conditions, this is adults now, um, find it really difficult to navigate the system. Um, they don't know what care they're entitled to for a start. So um, empowering consumers to actually understand the system, but it needs to be a two-way thing. It can't just be all the consumer's responsibility. Yeah, I was going to comment on that, Yvonne and Leanne. I'm enjoying this interplay with you and uh, we're stimulated by what Rochelle said. But, um, but um, some people, we often hear, don't we, that the only constant across the patient journey is the patient. And they move across the different settings and episodes of care. But taken to its extreme, that puts perhaps for some patients too much pressure on them to be not only the protector of their own health, but the guardian of all the data and, you know, the repository of all the information. Where's the boundaries for that? Where, how, what, how, how do we do that well? Um, I, I just want to tell you an anecdote. We had several parents who had a big folder that they used to carry around with them, like a hard copy folder that had all the vital information about their child's complex condition and what they needed. And they took that to every appointment because if they were seeing someone new they wouldn't know the history they would they may not even know what the condition was if it was a rare condition yeah okay we do have a comment coming in uh, to the 
Alice, oh, John, John, you first. John, sorry, I didn't see your hand there. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I, was, I was just gonna yeah, answer, you, well, provide a, a slightly different perspective and answer your question about what, what would it take uh, to, to get more integrated care. And I think, I think there is a supply side uh, push. So in some of the discussions I've been privy to at the uh, local health network here, you know, they're predicting huge increases in demand uh, for hospital beds. Uh, you know, such that in the next 10 years, you know, we need double the amount of hospital beds if they don't do anything, you know, if they carry on with current practice. Uh, and, and as a result of that, they're really looking at uh, different ways of doing things. And that includes both digital uh, health, but in particular, Rochelle, the hospital in the home, you know, that, that is seen as, uh, you know, a pretty big uh, part of the solution to, to this predicted demand. So I think there is that supply side push towards looking for answers and I think uh, integrated care is part of that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've got a question coming in from Len Gray. Um, Australian doctors, and this speaks to what you said, uh, Rochelle. By the way, Rochelle, we, we've come to realise as we work with you over the years that you're a very special doctor and you are one who goes beyond. I, I mean that sincerely. Not, not every doctor who wants to be available by text or by message from all their patients. No, I, th I don't think that's true. I don't think I'm, I'm unique at all. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't say unique. I said special. <laughs> I think not every, not every doctor we know and work with wants to be that available for, to everyone, GPs, patients, etc. Um, Len says, Len Gray has come in to this a bit orthogonally and said, Australian doctors are substantially lower users of email with patients than many North American and European countries are compared with them. Either there's a disincentive or a cultural phenomenon operating here. And he wonders what the panel thinks about that. Because Australians, on the other hand, are very high users of email. Yeah. But he's suggesting showing doctors perhaps aren't compared to their colleagues overseas. I, I don't I can talk only anecdotally that that yeah. that increasingly patients are just emailing me directly. Um, they're not even going through the office. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and I think some of my colleagues are worried. I mean, there are medico legal things about what you put in writing. So I think you just have to be really careful about provision of advice. So when I when I reply, I'm always very cautious. Uh, and if if I'm not sure what their problem is, I'll just say I need to see you or or I'll ring them. Uh, so that might be part of the reticence. Um, and you know, and, and I think part of the problem is that, you know, there's no work-life balance. <laughs> it's it's all, you know, part of life now. So so that might be another issue, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's um I think that's right. Liam, and then I, I think in, in America, a lot of the email communication is via the patient portal. So it, it's not, it, again, it's systematized way of communicating where we tend to use commercial off the shelf email in Australia and we don't have the, the infiltration of patient portals that they do there. So whilst we use the term email, I think we need to also ju just, just consider that, that what they write becomes part of the electronic medical record via the patient portal. What the doctor replies also becomes part of the patient, patient portal. No, that's a well-made point. Thanks, Liam. Yvonne? I, I can't comment on the communication with patients, but I can certainly comment about communication between GPs and specialists. So when we were setting up the Heart Connect program, um, I was staggered that GPs still want to send referrals by fax. Mm -hmm. They feel that <laughs> email is not safe. They would rather do it by fax, which is incredible, really, to, <laughs> to think... I'm quite young, as you know, what's a fax? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, but many of them are still using faxes. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. Amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, I've heard before. Yeah, yeah. And we're still sending discharge summaries to doctor GPs by fax. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. So it's, it's, I think the primary care in Australia is keeping the fax industry going globally. Yeah. I don't think we even have one in the Institute. We don't think we have a fax. <laughs> I don't think I'm my organisation either. I think I think that speaks to the issue though of um, 
you know, digital, you know, I mentioned digital exclusion and inclusion being an issue from a, you know, consumer side of things in, in my sort of opening remarks, Jeffrey. but, you know, I think digital literacy um, and confidence and trust is is as much an issue um, on the provider side, maybe more than an issue on the provider side. Um, you know, reticence to use things like My Health Record, and we know that there are some, you know, reasons for that. Um, but you know, it's it's about it's about a change gender, isn't it? And um, you know, I think um, uh, you know one of the, we need to be thinking about what needs to happen on the provider side to encourage um, you know the utility and and, and use um, and uptake of of you know, platforms, uh, digital platforms, whether they're apps or portals or My Health Record or whatever it might be. Um, mm. You know, one of the concepts we're quite intrigued by at CHF is the idea of a, of a digital navigator, um, you know, who, who you know, a, a person with, her, you know, skills to sort of equip providers as well as patients to become much more um, digitally literate and, and, and in their comfort zone. Yeah, no, that's a point well taken. Liam, have you got your hand up from before or is it a new point? Oh, no, I was just going to make, make a, another comment that, Yvonne, I'm equally astounded that the hospital can't communicate with patient via email and um, you know, at some services in particular. Um, and, and, that, and the rationale that they use is that they don't know who's the recipient. You know, it, it, you may have an email, l.caffrey at uq.edu, and that's, you know, one-on-one -on -one email address, but many families have uh, multiple people use the same email address, and therefore there's a, you know, they're, they're hamstrung by a privacy concern. So uh, I really think one of the things that we can do um, in answer to Jeffrey's question is, is you know, have some guidance on, on you know, the use of email for patient communication. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, Liam. Uh, Andrew? I think, um, so I'm, I'm uh, still quite new to the uh, discussion around uh, e-health stuff. It's not my, my forte, um, but, but very interested in it. Um, and I guess in some of the stuff that we've been trying to do in Silent is, is be very agnostic to what the particular technology or solution might be. And, um, and I've become quite aware through our conversations that it's just a very, very messy system. Um, you're talking about silos earlier and how, how do we try and break down those barriers and integrate everything. And um, I'm very aware, um, someone once sent, said to me that, you know, it's very hard to redesign a system that was never designed in the first place. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it's uh, part of, I think, what, what, what we're trying to do in the economic evaluation space and how we map that to the, the, the context that we, we recognize as being quite complex and messy and, and always adapting and changing is thinking about how do we how do we set up the conditions the conditions conducive to change so rather than um, trying to design something in particular and then saying this is the evidence let's go do it let's 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 get it done is really trying to combat what what we really observe is is a lot of uh, disagreement among different specialties, clinical specialties, different organizations, lots of different stakeholders, lots of different disagreement about what the options are available and what the context actually is and how that's gonna change over time. Yeah. Um, but also some of the under like understanding of what the evidence means in a local context. So, you know, once we have an idea of, okay, we're in, we're in agreement, these are, this is the context, this is our, this is our, these are our options available to us. Still trying to combat some of the uncertainty then in terms of how, how would we expect these interventions to, to, to work in our, in our setting? And so a lot of sort of what we're, I guess we're trying to do generally um, is try and set a bit of a framework that, that our different sort of um, clinical stakeholders, consumer stakeholders, executive, administrative, political stakeholders can kind of engage in, participate in. So you know, really trying to make it as much of a, of a sort of deliberative process as possible, simply because we're, aware that we've been trying to do all this work of implementing things and we can generate all this evidence we can conduct piecemeal economic evaluations technology appraisals but unless it's part of some sort of ongoing living breathing discussion then it just kind of gets 
it's too hard. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we brought Tony Scott. Thank you, team. We brought Tony Scott into the discussion. Tony, you raised your hand. Um, uh, you are uh, in the previous session, and now we've asked you to join this session. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't access the Q&A. So anyway, um, uh, it's just a couple of observations. I think, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, using telephones and not getting paid for it, I guess that, you know, and there's a lot of distribution of different kinds of doctors and, and Rochelle will just ring up patients and they will ring up her. Um, but there are other doctors who, who will say, no, I can't call it. You have to come in um, in order to get your test result or in order to kind of, and this is this, this fee-for-service culture which prevents doctors just calling somebody up or sending them a, a message or something like that. So I think that's part of it. Um, and so that, that, that that's one kind of comment about how the payment model kind of prevents doctors from providing appropriate care from a patient's point of view. Um, the point is that I wrote a paper maybe about, well, a long time ago, tens and tens of years ago, called The Myths of Early Discharge. And one of the myths is that early discharge doesn't save money. Now, the, you know, it's like the unit cost for a patient being treated in the community is lower than, the, than they are in the hospital. But the only reason you're going to realize those savings is if the hospital closes beds, because <laughs> the hospital will just admit more people. So overall, the costs increase through, through early discharge, because the early discharge is then an extra service on top of this full hospital of patients. So, you know, the, there's issues about private health insurers lobbying for for to be able to cover kind of this, this home care stuff so that it would lower out of pocket costs and but it won't unless private hospitals kind of close some beds, which isn't going to happen. So, so I think there's there's some issues there about the um, the realization of these potential cost savings, which is very difficult unless hospitals downsize. Um, maybe, yeah. And I well, think I the perverse incentives that you're talking about too. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of the myth of where the cost savings really are and where they go. Yeah. yeah, very good. Liam? Sorry, similarly, our first body of work for the Sustainability Centre was looking at the, the, the cost of telehealth because there is a myth and probably, you know, that telehealth saves the health system money. And and the, the review that we did found that that was the case in around half half of services, but the other half of services had actually increased the cost. And those that saved money, the payback period ranged between one year, almost instantly, to up to 11 years to recoup the initial cost of implementing the telehealth service. So I, again, you know, this misconception that hospital in the home saves money, telehealth saves money. and that Because, yeah, improving access can increase demand as well. Mm-mm. Oh, for sure. So, I mean, many people have skated over the top of this rather than dealt with it, these questions, rather than dealt with it in depth, as we're trying to do this afternoon, have axiomatically and unquestionably assumed that hospital in the home and telly, whatever, telly everything, saves money. And we're really grappling with something that's much more complex than this. Than this. But the one thing we haven't looked at is the, is the patient experience. Maybe it's not saving money, but it might be a better patient experience. Right? True. So, I mean, I think that that needs to be allowed for as well. So the system might be saving money, but the patient experience might be improved, um, except in the case of hospital in the home, Rochelle, where you've got carers who are then the unpaid staff looking after, after people. So I, I think it's, you know, it's not binary. No. So, you know, and I think, you know, I mean, something that, um, when I was in the States a couple of times actually, Michael Porter's um, uh, partner in crime is a guy called um, Tom Lee, who was clinician at Massachusetts General and was a CEO of um, Partners Healthcare. And the, very, the thing that stuck in my mind the first time he gave a presentation, when he stood up, he said, you know, he'd been, a, he'd been around for quite a, a long time in, this, in the system. And he said, working with Michael and the work that we were, we were doing, made me realise is we do, do not, in healthcare, we do not understand the business we are in. We do not understand the business. And that's not meant in a, in a commercial sense, it's just how things work. So we've got a system that's just kind of grown up over many, many, many decades, right? Systems, culture, behaviour, all of that. 
And, and we've got, we're now now trying to sort some of it out. Whereas if you started with a blank sheet of paper, you'd be doing that something very different. Yeah, if you right? started with a blank piece of paper, you wouldn't end up with what we've got now. It, it, exactly. However, you can't. That's right. That's right. So we can't, we can't give up. But we also have to, I, I think, accept why we are challenged, with why we've got so many challenges. Unless we have one of Andrew's models, which sorts it all yeah, out for us. You know, that's all model. Yeah, we we'll need more modeling, Andrew. We love the modeling. Give us another model. Yeah. Uh, we've got John, we need a health economist back in this conversation. John Carter. Um, yeah, I guess I was just two two comments, I guess, um, in relation to the recent discussion. The, the first is that, yeah, is using tele, telehealth, hospital health, et cetera, can create additional demand. But I think if you, talk to a lot of people in the health service they'll say it's uh facilitating the unmet need uh meeting unmet need especially in the ed so you know we're working with the ed physicians here and you know they basically uh blame <laughs> uh long stay uh or, or the inpatient part of the hospital for not discharging hospital uh, patients soon enough which then creates backlog in the ed and ramping and you know the story um, so, so I think, yeah, it may not save costs uh, by by investing in telemedicine and, and hospital and home, but it, it it may be essential to 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 meet some of that uh, unmet, unmet need that's uh, causing problems in the health system. Uh, and then I guess in terms of from the patient perspective, um, the other thing that you hear uh, about uh, long inpatient stays is the risk of deconditioning. Uh, and, and long-term complications. So patients may have uh, short-term preferences for being in or out of hospital, but uh, you know, if you take into consideration hospital-acquired complications and uh, effects of deconditioning, then, then that's another thing that needs to be, um, be considered in that context. Sure. Hospitals are dangerous places. You know, they've got drugs and sharp things and, you know, things to do to you. So, uh, yeah. All right. I've got a couple of final questions and then we'll ask for anyone who wants to on the panel to sum up uh, from all that they've heard. One question is from Anonymous. One of the benefits from telehealth items introduced during COVID-19 COVID was to remote communities. Those communities don't have consistent access to GPs, patients, were at, uh, GPs. Patients were able to go to the health service and while in the consulting room with a nurse or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health practitioner, they were able to access a GP remotely via telehealth. This access to other specialists has been available before COVID. Should GPs be permanently added to the list of clinicians available by this model of telehealth in primary care? Liam. Um, even before COVID, patients that were in modified Monash area 6 to 10 had access to um, MBS subsidised GP consultations. So they already are a permanent part of the Medicare benefits schedule if, they, if the patient resides in those um, remoteness areas. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. And the and same for specialist care as well, if you live a certain distance away. Yep. Okay, so I'm sure that that, uh, that um, questioner would be happy to hear that. A couple of questions. Um, well, no, final question from Scott Bell, and then he's got a second addition to it. I'll just read it to you. I think it's a matter of whether you're measuring the effect on whole population costs of healthcare. This is for the health economists, but anybody can answer, which is impacted by increased use of health services per capita, or whether you're measuring cost savings of procedures as an average separation cost. So he's just making this distinction between are we measuring at the population level or the unit cost. And then he adds a note afterwards, thank you Scott Bell for the uh, extended question. The question above is related to the discussion of whether shorter length of stay stroke use of home care, home-based care reduces costs of care. So he's saying, and I think the economists would agree, uh, it's a matter of whether you're measuring whole of population costs or unit costs. Maybe I can add to that and just say um, something that um, John and I talk about a lot and something I'm learning more and more about is, uh, yes, the this perspective really matters in, in, uh, in conducting the kind of evaluations that we do. So who's, from whose perspective are we talking about value? 
what's the, the definition of that? And um, a lot of the conversations that we're having, even just at an LHN level, so not thinking about the, the flow on um, um, sort of societal perspective or greater community perspective uh, around, um, you know, what is the value to you of uh, uh, reducing your bed days. If you're reducing your length of stay, you, you alleviate resources. Now you're going to extract that. Is there a realizable saving or are you going to repurpose it? Someone else is going to fill that bed. Is it valuable? And even from an LHM perspective, they've, they've got sub perspectives. You know? Are they approaching it from a, an accounting perspective? Is it just, um, if, we, if we place a, a dollar value on that bed day, that's released in terms of the amount of funding versus expenditure they would attach to that. Depending on who goes into that bed, they might lose a lot more money. So it may not be, they may not want to put someone else in that bed. Yeah, Some other right. patients, they gain money. But then there's the broader conversation that John was sort of flagging with the ED. Is if they're able to improve health outcomes mm -hmm. for other patients within the system, as the system sort of reorients itself, resorts itself, um, you know, we, it, that might represent a, a, a value for money investment in the improvement of the experience, the outcomes, not just in those patients for whom we've shortened their length of stay uh, and improved the appropriateness of the care, but also of the other patients who have been able to take on that alleviated resource. So we're, we're, that's actually in some of the, one of the first slides I was talking through is some of those scenarios or conditions under which interventions might represent value for money. Um, that's, the, that's one of the conversations we have with the LHN, just from within their perspective, what would be the value of those length of stay reductions in the bed days and things like that. So just getting them to think through it, because there isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer with different perspectives. Yeah, look, um, I remember, you probably shouldn't draw on your own anecdotes if you're moderating, but I remember years and years and years ago when I worked in the system, I was at a pretty high powered meeting and somebody made the point you know, we don't owe a duty of care or have any responsibility for any patient that doesn't come into our catchment area and within our care. And, you know, on the one hand, that person was right, but on the other hand, that's very disappointing for, for, for if you try to operate much more broadly uh, to try and help improve the health status of the population. Uh, so um, uh, that perspective definitely does matter, Andrew, you are absolutely correct. Now, our adequate, oh, sorry, Rochelle, did you want to comment on that too or is that any other aspect of things? Well, I, I just want to remind us that our previous session that, that we know a third of healthcare is unnecessary and 10% is harmful and healthcare contributes 7% to the carbon footprint in Australia, which is enormous. Uh, which I think it's the same as the whole of South Australia. Uh, so we should also be mindful that that whether those patients should be in those beds and, and whether we can reduce costs and reduce environmental impact. And I think that's a really important take home message. That is an absolutely important take home message. Thank you for raising it, um, Rochelle. Okay, we're in the final few minutes and uh, at the PCHSS, we always like to say that we finish on time and on budget. I've got Kayleen and Genevieve nodding furiously to them. So, um, Let's go around the table and take any final observations, and then maybe we'll end up with Leanne and perhaps you and then see if you want to make any final comments. Around the table, Liam. Nothing further from me, Jeffrey. Okay, thanks for your presentation, Liam. Very Thank you. I heard you speak on telly, telly stuff very good many times, and it's really uh, it's really great to have somebody doing that depth of analysis on telemedicine and telehealth that you are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andrew and John. Uh, I just, uh, one thing I wrote down when Yvonne was speaking was um, she talked about when you uh, implementing or designing interventions for different contexts, you either adjust the intervention or the context. And that was something I hadn't thought about before. So I'm going to have to put a little bit of thought into how you could adjust the context rather than the intervention. Very good, John. So regardless of what the participants took away, you took away something very useful. You, you'll send them an invoice, won't you, Yvonne? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, okay, but excellent. The email uh, is andrew.partington. <laughs> that's the one. 
Thank you very much, both of you. Um, and I haven't really thought a lot about small scale economic sort of evaluations and then how do you scale them up? So that was very useful as well. Thank you. Um, Yvonne? Yeah, look, uh, I do harp on about this, but you know, robust evaluations of interventions in the health system are really, really important. And, um, yeah. and making those evaluations publicly available is also really important. Uh, I think departments of health are very good at, you know, getting consultants in to do evaluations and then those evaluations are behind, um, you know, firewalls that the rest of us can't access. Um, and academics are just as guilty of that if our papers are behind firewalls in journals. So I would really like to make a plea for making results of evaluations publicly available. So yeah. we all learn from them. Thank you, Yvonne, for your plea. Rochelle? Uh, I think I already had the final word before, um, but I, I, I guess evaluation, I was surprised when we looked at models of care and the lack of evidence about even equivalent health outcomes, let, a, let alone whether it was cost efficient or not. Uh, and I would plead to add environmental impact for those alternate models of care and, and you know, what are the trade-offs with more expensive and more uh, environmentally unsustainable practices versus cheaper uh, alternatives. Thank you. Okay. And then? I'm just looking at the title of today, Jeffrey. Our challenge was how do we create value-based integrated health <coughs> systems? My answer is after listening to the tour de force is with a lot of work and effort. <laughs> well, it's um, a complex adaptive system, exactly. so it's not amenable to change that's easy or linear. Exactly. But I guess the other question I would pose to us, and this is a rhetorical question, what might be the one, two, three, four things that we could recommend out of today that may move us towards that? An example would be, uh, and you know, follows Tony's presentation. You know, some of the would one of the strongest levers be the way in which we are, you know, the payment systems. You know, could that be something that might start moving things? Uh, what are those things that we've talked about today that may have the potential of moving things? Um, within a system that is that we've got in Australia, which is that we've got the Commonwealth State Divide. Um, so we've got jurisdictional issues. We, we're not good at doing um, big health reform in this country. I mean, if you look at where the big reform pieces have come from, generally at a national level, so out of the Commonwealth, you know, we had Medicare in 84, if you go back to Medibank in 75. Uh, probably the last big reforms came out of the Rudd Gillard reforms. Um, activity based funding, um, you know, governance systems, primary health networks, um, performance measures matched to funding. So, put our minds to it, what could move this along at a national reform level? You know, it's interesting you say that because that's true, and yet the system changes and improves over time. The system we've got now, with all the problems we talked about in the last four hours, is a better health system for most patients than it was 20 years ago. And it was infinitely better than it was 40 years ago, but quality of care that is able to be provided. So it does change, it doesn't necessarily change in the sort of time frame we would sometimes like it to change. The other thing is that safety two thing that Enrico pointed out that we've done a lot of work on. The amazing thing about the health system isn't how poorly it performs. The amazing thing about the health system is a system this complex does so well most of the time. That's extraordinary. So, so there's that bit too, the glass half full uh, element. But yes, um, maybe we need to trawl through some of the notes that we've made today out of all the things that people have said to see if we can come up with some headline things. We're probably too immersed in the detail now, unless somebody wants to make a comment. I'm going to hand over to you, Leanne, shortly. I wonder 
Kayleen's reminded me that the other panelists have joined us from the earlier session. If you were with us for the whole journey, did you have a comment by way of helping us sum up in the last five minutes or so? <clears throat> you can pass or play. Enrico, Paul, Tony, Joanna? No? That's okay, fine. Leanne? Oh, Paul, thank you. Yeah, I, I, one of, I think a lesson from both sessions, but particularly this session is um, how counterintuitive a lot of the solutions are. It's sort of, I've forgotten who said that for every complex problem, there's a simple solution and it's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so, so some of these cost issues that we've just been discussing, for example, where the, the um, telehealth mostly doesn't save money or hospital in the home doesn't, are counterintuitive to a lot of people. And I think that's one of the problems that we have in getting attention on the research need for sustainability is that a lot of these solutions actually need to be thoroughly researched and sorted out because that most of the, the solutions are not simple and need good evaluation, as Joanna was saying. Yeah, of course, that's a bit self-serving of us, Paul, because I totally agree with that, but it means yeah. we, we don't <laughs> to work anytime soon. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to declare the conflict of interest at the beginning. <laughs> that's right. As if there weren't enough conflicts of interest around a group like this. Okay, uh, Leanne, back to you. The consumer voice should always start and finish. Uh -huh. Any final observations for us? Yeah, look, got just a couple of takeouts from me, Jeffrey. I, I think, you know, integration is hard. It's hard. <laughs> um, and, it's, and it's local. And I, I take your point that, you know, it's, hap it's actually sort of happening in pockets um, and at varying scales often in spite of lack of the sort of brave policy agenda that um, Annette's talking about. But um, I suppose I would, <clears throat> I think what we do need though is um, the accelerator effect of, of a sort of an authorising policy environment. And I sort of, ref when I say that I'm reflecting on, you know, particularly the New South Wales agenda around the value-based healthcare thinking and, you know, their co-commissioning work and their commitment to, you know, elevating the human experience. I think having those sorts of things in, 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 in an authorising set of policy statements so that local hospital networks and PHNs can then be incentivised to, to, to really do some of that, you know, more progressive co-commissioning and co-production really does have an accelerator effect. And probably, probably the last thing I would leave you with is we talk a lot about collaborative practice and, um, you know, PHNs and LHNs working together and um, different providers working together, uh, specialist GPs, et cetera, but, um, and the importance of clinical leadership. But I think the next, the next frontier, if I can use that grand expression, is really collaborative practice between um, uh, you know, clinicians, health administrators, and consumers and community voices. Um, uh, there's there's models that that can facilitate that, and I think that's we've got to much more systematically bring in um, consumer insights and perspectives and preferences into um, future discussions. Yeah. Thanks, Jeffrey. And I think we are, Leanne, but it's um, as you say, it's hard, and it's um, it's not necessarily at a pace we would like. So if I can just draw this to a conclusion at the risk of finishing early, Kaylin, Kaylin's looking astonished and uh, scared, I think even. Uh, um, Rico said, uh, you know, uh, how re replicable is digital health research? And maybe half of it's not replicable and therefore there's a question mark about it. But I'm sure, Enrique, you would agree that that's not the case about the replicability of the work of the PCHSS, which I'm sure you have every confidence is completely replicable and of the highest quality. And then finally, um, you know what encouraged me was not just the research that's going on here that's fantastic, but what the jurisdictions are now doing with some of that research, hearing from WA and New South Wales, They've got as tough a job as any researcher, tough maybe, because they've got to manage the system. And uh, they were integrating a lot of what we're doing into their uh, initiatives in trying to join up the system and make it um, 
uh, higher quality, better value, and more integrated. So that was very encouraging for me. I don't know about you, Annette. Uh, but that yeah, no, no, I'm, it, it is very encouraging, yeah. um, you know, particularly when you look at the breadth of what New South Wales is um, working towards. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and, and maybe they do set a good, um, and Western Australia, and you know, their, you know, their, their challenges are different. Yeah. Um, you know, that out of this may come things that, that can then be taken up to, to inform a more national approach, shared, all sorts of things. So I, I agree. Well, I'll draw this to a close, and we do risk running a few minutes early, which is a fantastic thing. Uh, everyone's got a lot to get on with. Have to get stuck out. So can I thank you, firstly, all the participants and all the people who signed up and came. Can I thank all the presenters? It was fantastic. I learned a lot, and I'm sure we all did. Fantastic set of talks. Can I thank the PCHSS team for always organising these things of such a high quality and bringing together great people? Uh, can I thank the chairs, Leanne, and um, uh, uh, Leanne especially, thank you for the consumer perspective, and Annette, You've been with us for the entire journey of the PCHSSS and before, so yes. thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, wish you all well in your integration and value based creation work. Thank you, everyone. Declare the meeting closed. Jeffrey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.